I asked Tom to, to come to the podium and to make his talk about uh, optimal systemic therapy in setting of hepatic and renal dysfunction. Tom, your place. <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, the uh, optimal systemic therapy uh, in hepatic and renal dysfunction, um, which is appropriate in view of what I was doing last night. Um, I've pressed the wrong slide already. Oh, here we go. Is it just... Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with renal dysfunction, if I may, and then move across to hepatic dysfunction. I think the hepatic issue is more complicated. Um, I don't think we know enough about either, to be honest. I think the reason we don't know so much about renal dysfunction is actually um, the problem isn't as big a problem as perhaps we make it out to be. Uh, the issue with hepatic dysfunction is I think actually we lack a little bit of an understanding about exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, and I think as a group, including myself, we're just a little bit confused uh, about what a transaminitis is and what, about, well, and what um, hepatic failure is. So this is the, um, um, obviously, compars, and this is looking at increased creatinine associated with pisoponib and sinicinib. And as you can say, it's, vanish it's vanishingly rare. So these drugs are not associated with um, dramatic problems in terms of renal function. But this is a patient, I've got a couple of patients um, which I'm going to talk about, um, who, are, who we saw um, um, just recently. 67-year-old female, nephrectomy um, in 2010, non-independent diabetes, um, grade 3 clear cell renal cancer in the remaining kidney, so relapsed contralaterally, creatinine 240, creatinine clearance less than 20, as you can see, a big mass. And we have a long debate, as I'm sure you all do in the room, about whether you remove this mass and but the problem with this individual was actually they had widespread metastatic disease with liver and lung disease. Um, and the issue is um, what we do here, do we uh, give them systemic therapy? And I could see from the graphs of the questions that we've answered already that uh, people are keen to treat these patients. And certainly the options go along nephrectomy and systemic therapy. We wouldn't do that because obviously you would um, render them dialysis dependent by doing that nephrectomy. The second option is systemic therapy, which is attractive. Observation alone, and Brian talks a bit about observation, this individual had intermediate risk disease. We tend to start targeted therapy in these individuals. Uh, and then nephrectomy alone, which is, I don't think is a particularly attractive option. So we went for option two, systemic therapy. Now, which therapy do we give and at which dose? And I think the second question probably is more important than the first question because there is a little bit of data out there suggesting to us that actually we may be playing around a little bit with these drugs. Um, so the data that is available, this is a creatinine clearance of less than 60. And actually, this is relatively common. Lots of patients have a creatinine clearance less than 60. So this is not an uncommon situation. And in fact, I, looking at a creatinine clearance of less than 60, I am actually not too concerned about this sort of level. And I wouldn't bat an eye about giving full dose and going straight in. And I probably wouldn't get overexcited about it either. And you can see from here, and I accept the numbers are very small, um, and this is about the best data we've got. Um, but you can see from here that there's nothing standing out on this page to suggest that sunitinib is not safe in this population. Um, I guess um, the same applies for mTOR inhibitors. Again, very small numbers, but effectively in this population with moderately impaired renal function, both drugs look very safe. Um, and uh, the key question, I guess, is in this population with moderate renal impairment, do the drugs actually work? Um, very few of these patients require a dose reduction. And you can see with a progression-free survival of 10 months, um, with response rates in the 20%, there's no suggestion in this moderately impaired population that, number one, we should be playing around the, with the dose. Number two is we can give any of the drugs and we should be comfortable with all of them, pisoponib, sunitinib, and mTOR inhibitors. Uh, and number three is we shouldn't expect necessarily patients to do badly, although I accept completely the numbers are small. And you can see here from the tolerability slide that actually the drugs are relatively well tolerated. Again, nothing stands out from the page suggesting that we should be doing anything different in this population. 
This is a slightly more complicated issue, and Simon Chowdhury um, um, led this study from, uh, from guys. Another retrospective analysis um, looking at more severe uh, renal dysfunction. So these people have a creatinine clearance less than 25, uh, or they're on hemodialysis. Um, and um, two things for me. Uh, number one is I expected um, a lot more toxicity. Uh, I expected um, uh, a lot less, this is supposed to be an F, not a D, I apologise. I didn't expect a progression free of 10.5 months. I was expecting uh, a mixed match of patients. The one thing that did stand out, though, is over 50% of patients started in less than, 50, less than uh, uh, suboptimal doses. So that's most patients starting sunitinib 37.5 or pazopinib 400. Lots of people dose escalating without problems. I think that, to me, demonstrates a nervousness. And that nervousness is being generated by a lack of data. Um, so, um, I think what we have is in moderate renal impairment, we have no concerns. In more severe renal impairment, we have a nervous community, but actually when you give the drugs, the toxicity profile and the outcome actually looks pretty good. So, perhaps we should be confident or slightly more confident in this population. Remember, the drugs aren't metabolized um, by the, the kidney, so we shouldn't get too focused on that. There are some PK results, and this I'm just now on the final part of the renal. I'm going to talk about hemodialysis patients. I'm nervous about hemodialysis patients, and I've treated um, half a dozen, perhaps. Um, there has been some quite nice PK work done both here and in a couple of slides I'm going to show in a minute. And the key to this PK data is twofold. Number one is when you give sunitinib both at decreased dose and at higher doses, you can see from this curve here um, it's this bar, it's the bar here, the, um, the, the, the solid buff, is the, is the, the dose that one would, would like. Um, and you can see from here that we can achieve doses that are equivalent to those done in the phase 1 PK studies um, on hemodialysis. Um, so give the drugs seems to be the message from these results. Um, and number two is the sunitinib concentration um, seems to be independent of the timing of the dialysis. So uh, we shouldn't get too fixated on giving the drug two hours before or two hours after dialysis. Um, so remember, the half-life of these drugs are relatively long. So that's a question which I'm often asked is, if you're on hemodialysis, when should we be giving the drugs? It doesn't seem to matter that much. Should we be giving 37.5 or 50, 400 of pazopinib or 800? Again, I don't think we know um, um, the answer to that question. Um, and I would suggest close monitoring of these individuals because of the lack of data that we have. But I think caution is wise, but I don't think that this is a hopeless situation and we should treat these patients where we can um, appropriately. This is more pharmacokinetic data supporting the previous slide, but not actually adding very much to it beyond the PK suggests that the dosing on hemodialysis falls with the PK data falls within what we would um, acknowledge as standard type PK results. So just to summarize um, the first part of this, and I think it's the easier part, um, I think the data's not great. And I just think maybe why is the data not great? And I don't think it's because um, we don't have the opportunity to publish, because I'm sure that any of us in the room could collect a, a, gather a group of friends together and get two or 300 patients within a year. I think it's actually because we're not as excited about this area as we could be, because the preliminary data that's come out suggests that there isn't a problem. And it's very rare for me to speak to people about patients with problems in this area. So I don't think um, we should get too focused on this issue. Um, I think we should work towards standard dosing. Um, and I think this applies for particularly those individuals with moderate and more severe renal um, impairment, because it doesn't appear that these patients are compromised, and it does appear that we can get good efficacy results. And I wouldn't get too fixated on the hemodialysis issue either. Um, it doesn't necessarily make things more complicated. I would encourage close monitoring, but I don't think, again, it's a hopeless situation. I'm now going to move across, if I may, to the second part of the talk, which is totally unrelated to the first part of the talk, but follows a similar line, and that is actually hepatic impairment. And liver toxicity 
uh, is graded by child, a child pew score. Um, these are the parameters. It's like the hang criteria. You get points, and then you go from A to C. And with this, you can predict treatment algorithms and outcome. And this is what the liver doctors do at all of our institutions day in, day out. What they don't do is they don't focus on CTC criteria for transaminitis. They don't actually look at the transaminitis, as I'm sure we all know, when an individual goes in with liver failure after a paracetamol overdose, they're not talking about grade three or grade four. They're interested in albumin, they're interested in INRs, they're interested in encephalopathy. But what we're doing with all of the VEGF TKIs is we're giving drugs and we're identifying transient transaminitises. And I think at times we're calling this liver toxicity and I'm not sure those two fit particularly well with one another. And again, CTC criteria, and I've banged on about this many times, and I will again today, they weren't designed for um, VEGF TKI therapy. They were designed to assess chemotherapy toxicity. And it's very important that we remember that these figures here of grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, and grade 4 are very much plucked from the air and don't really mean if you have grade three toxicity, there's been work to suggest that's worse than having grade two toxicity. And that's a really important message that I'm gonna try and get out today if I can, because um, it's again a question that I'm asked a lot. And actually there is a real dearth of data in this area about what it actually means if you get a transaminitis, whether or not you need to stop the drugs, and whether or not you can rechallenge. And I'm going to try and address some of those issues today if I can. So I'll do this in, um, with a patient. So this individual, um, a transaminitis, 62-year-old male, starts with an ALT at baseline, um, posopinib 800 milligrams, standard doses. On cocodamol, there's this paracetamol issue which people sometimes talk to me about. Um, and after five weeks, we've got a grade three transaminitis. I'm not going to ask um, the room what they would do, but uh, we kept going, and we actually uh, kept going. And after week seven, they had moved from a grade three transaminitis, sorry, it had moved from a grade one to a grade two transaminitis. ALT, the upper limit of normal, and continuing on posopinib. And I hope by the end of the talk, on the next five minutes, I'm going to have given you some clarity about what we should be doing on this individual. So what's the data that we know? So this is sinistib again. This is the COMPARS trial. Um, so as you can see, he's raised ALT, both drugs causing 60%, um, grade 3 or 4 toxicity. Um, that's a transaminitis. So remember, that's going to be... Um, the raised um, a, um, level, and you can see pazopinib higher than sunitinib here. So a transient traminitis, transaminitis being caused by both drugs, but pazopinib more of the grade 3 toxicity, and the same applies for raised ALT. So the question that I'm often asked is when does this occur? Um, and this is some work, this is some retrospective work that we did in a series of 100 and um, uh, 25 patients, a number of people in the room involved, both from London and the United States. Um, and the issue here is you can see that actually the occurrence is occurring um, particularly in the first 12 weeks of therapy. So 90% of these events on posopinib occurring in the first 12 weeks. Um, and in fact, the more severe, the grade 3 and 4 trans transaminitis, all of it occurring within the first 10 weeks of therapy. The current guidelines for LFT monitoring are this three-weekly process. So you can see from this, uh, looking at these um, 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 blood test measurements, you can see that we're measuring them regularly, and we are going to identify most of the transaminitis during this period of time here. Um, as time goes by, when you look at these patients here, some of these patients, of course, they've developed transaminitis. Some of those are associated with things like progression of disease. So after this period, it appears to be very rare. Um, and uh, the second important question is, okay, so we've developed the transaminitis. How long does it take for the LFTs to normalize? And when can we expect to restart the patient back on therapy? And you can see from here, the median time is approximately four weeks um, to get back to a grade one, a less than grade one uh, transaminitis. Um, the issue about grade one, as I said before, is that's never been validated as the time to restart. And many people in this room and many people I'm speaking to are restarting drugs with patients who still have a raised ALT 
or AST. And so therefore, most people are starting or restarting between three and five weeks in this series in which we looked at. So the next question, which uh, is, can we give the same drugs safely for a second time? Can you re-challenge with pazopinib or if it occurred with sunitinib or serafinib, can you re-challenge with those drugs too? So 32 of our patients were re-challenged, and many of them were re-challenged back at the original dose. And actually, the recurrence of the toxicity only occurred in seven of these 32 patients. And so one of two things is happening. Either there's a tolerance is occurring, this is a transient period which is self-resolving, or the dose reduction is effective. Um, I'm just going to point out this one patient. So one patient, for whatever reason, actually didn't stop. He developed a grade 2 toxicity and didn't stop pazopinib, just kept going straight through. And actually, it was a self-resolving problem. So this may actually be a self-resolving issue. Yes, I do think we need to address it, and particularly for those patients who develop an extreme transaminitis, but I don't think it's, again, a hopeless situation. I think we need to be very prudent. We need to wait for normalisation, but I think we, we can re-challenge. Whether or not you re-challenge with the same drug or switch to a different drug is very much up to you, as I see it. Just the last couple of slides, and the numbers are very small, and I don't want to be too provocative, but for those patients who developed a grade 0 or a grade 2 to 4 toxicity, you can see uh, there may be a small difference between those and the individuals who developed this grade 1 toxicity. So the issue out there is like the hypertension, is there a correlation between development of toxicity and outcome. Um, this data does not suggest that. Uh, more data is required, but I think it's an interesting area. Uh, and I just thought I would just give this slide, um, and this is the recommendations on pazopinib-related liver toxicity, and I think this is a useful slide. Again, um, look at the re reassurance. So transaminitis levels of less than eight times the upper limit of normal continue on drug. I'm not sure how many in people in the room are not interrupting after five. Certainly, historically, that's what we've been doing. This suggests that, yes, we should be monitoring and monitoring regularly, but we should also have confidence that we are able to do this safely. Um, if it occurs in concurrence with a raised bilirubin, the situation is somewhat different. And obviously, if it goes above eight times the upper of the normal, interrupt. If it is going to occur, it will happen in the first 12 weeks interrupt, restart, and you can restart safely either pazopinib or an alternative agent like sunitinib. Uh, so this is the patient who I was treating, and actually, um, I, uh, at five times of all, I dose interrupt this patient. This was treated some time ago. I think the message is keep calm and carry on uh, to a point, but obviously close observation is very important. Whether or not stopping the paracetamol at this point is wise, I personally did it. I'm not sure there's any evidence it helps. Uh, so what I'd like to just conclude, if I may, uh, is to say that specifically for this hepatic part of the talk, let's be really clear this is not liver failure or liver toxicity. It's a transaminitis. It's very different from the Charles Pew score. It's a transient event which is occurring in the treatment course that requires monitoring. Rechallenge is possible and safe and it's usually okay. CTC criteria, again, unfortunately here, I think being counterproductive in my opinion, and we probably should work together to work out a better way of doing this. And yes, we need a lot more data in this area because I think it will be helpful for the community. Um, thank you very much indeed.